You're about to hear a rebroadcast of The Colin McEnroe Show. It originally aired November 14th, 2019, here on Connecticut Public Radio. Welcome to today's show. If you were to look at all the shows that we've done in 2019, I was just mentioning this today to a producer, Betsy Kaplan, I, kind of without exactly planning it. We've done an awful lot of shows that might fall into the category of crime and punishment, uh, quite a lot of shows that look at the way the American justice system is often not really worthy of that name, ways in which it kind of doesn't function the way we think it functions. And I, I, I don't know exactly why that is, except that it's it's something that has started to really bother me personally. Uh, and uh, so we're very excited to be doing this show. We, even if I didn't have that abiding interest, and Betsy Kaplan has it, has it too, we'd be doing the show because Charles Barber is somebody that I tremendously like and respect. Uh, he's, I've known him since I was on the other radio station many, many years ago. And that's when he started appearing. So, and if he does a book, we just, whatever it is, we just do it. So Charles Barber, writer in residence at Wesleyan University, director of the, uh, the Connection Institute, a criminal justice research organization, uh, author of three books most recently, Citizen Outlaw, One Man's Journey from Gang Leader to Peacekeeper. And apropos of that, also in studio with me is William Juneboy Outlaw III, who co-directs the Connecticut Violence Intervention Pro- Program. He's also a senior community advocate at Goodwill Reentry Program, where he helps formerly incarcerated people reenter the community. We're going to uh, talk today about um, William's uh, past, present, and future, and and what it what it symbolizes and what kinds of problems uh, it points to and what kinds of solutions uh, his life and his situation point to. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable journey. And so, Charlie, I'm going to ask you just to give us a, kind of a Publishers Weekly synopsis uh, of this book so we can begin the conversation there. Well, for people who don't know, what's the book about? It's uh, a biography of William's story from uh, growing up in public housing, really rough public housing in New Haven, lots of uh, abuse as a kid, um, not having a very good experience in the public school system in New Haven, dropping out at 14, eventually running a gang with 40 guys, making, no one was really counting it with so much money, but probably a million dollars a year at age 14 to 17, 18, and then it all kind of blew up. Uh, and he was sentenced for 85 years in prison uh, for various offenses. Then there was an appeal. He unexpectedly got out after 20 years, and the last third of the book is about the remarkable work he's doing in the community, which I think he sees as atoning for his past in New Haven. So, William, I want to start with today. We can we can talk about the past. We will talk about the past, but I want to start with today. So, if I met you, I don't know, after church or in line at Dunkin' Donuts or just walking down Chapel Street in New Haven, who would I meet? Who, who would I be talking to if I met you today? <laughs> You'd be talking to uh, a 51-year-old man that's probably asking you what's the best restaurant downtown. <laughs> uh, you know, but you'd know the answer to that question, I would assume. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. There yeah. are a lot of new restaurants in New Haven, so that's the kind of guy you'll probably meet that day. Tell uh, me a little bit more about that guy. What's he, what's he can, first of all, explain what it is you're doing right now. What is it you do with your days? Oh, uh, my days is, I work two full-time jobs, so yeah. my day is, you know, pretty hectic. Uh, some days I just take to myself. So if I'm downtown, probably down here looking for having dinner with me and my fiance, <laughs> and I'm just strolling through New Haven, where it's a beautiful city, uh, especially downtown area has been revived with all these nice restaurants, and I'm hopefully to get to each and every one of them. So that's the type of guy you would meet that day. Uh, but what I'm doing today is just basically, uh, I believe it's what uh, I was uh, given by God, talented, you know, to redeem myself as far as uh, being a man. Right. So one of the things that you're doing has to do with, as the title of the program suggests, violence intervention. The idea being that instead of finding a way to arrest people after they commit crimes, try to do something before that happens. Get get to the kid before the cops arrest the kid. And, and, and so can you say a little bit more about that? How does that work? Most definitely. I mean, intervention is big with me. I mean, uh, I wish someone had got to me a little sooner. Uh, but, uh, yes, uh, we try at uh, CTVIP, Connecticut Violence Intervention, we try to uh, go to one individuals between the age of uh, 13 to 25 
and we try to intervene if we know that individuals are involved in any activity that leads to violence. It could start off as just being a drug dealer, uh, what we call a stick-up boy. That's one person that do robberies in the community or someone that's breaking in the house. Any type of violence that can lead to violence, we try to intervene to that person. Uh, we reach out to them, and we have a one-on-one -on -one talk and let them know that if— uh, if we know what's going on, we must certainly, the police, going to know what's going on sooner or later because if it fell on my lap, it fell on our organization lap, that means uh, someone is talking. One thing that I read about you, uh, or one thing that became clear from Charlie's book and, and also other stuff that I've read is one of the reasons that you can sometimes stop violence is because you understand violence better than maybe a lot of even police understand violence. For example, one term I learned from reading about you is what you, what you and I guess other people call face fighting. Uh, face fighting is what happens, I guess, before actual fighting starts. Oh, yes, that's the most serious thing. And I don't want to just say, uh, be honest with you, in the African-American community, it starts with a, a, a very serious uh, stare down, uh, intimidating stare down, uh, and, and that is called face fighting. And, and usually that leads to one saying, you know, what you, if you're looking at, and then after that, altercation can start. So what do you do? Let's say that you see that. You get called into an area. Maybe there's people from two different neighborhoods and they're starting to do that. What would you say to two guys or two groups of guys who are starting to give each other those kinds of dirty looks? Well, usually those is probably start at a football game, a basketball game. You get people from different neighborhoods at a party or somewhere. So we try to be out, let out. When a club let out, we try to be there too because of these situations that we know uh, a lot of face fighting could have been going on in the club. So we just try to have a strong presence. But if we know that this is going on, I personally would step to the individual, both individuals, and uh, try to have a conversation with both of them about what's the problem. I see you staring at him. I see you face fighting him. What it's about, you know. Uh, most of the time, 80, 90% of the time, it works with me intervening or one of the outreach workers intervening and having that straight-up conversation. In this work, you got to be real observant uh, as far as, keeping your eyes and on understanding, like you said, understanding what face fighting is. And sometimes the body language and uh, face fighting, you can learn a lot about a situation that's about to happen. Reading about William in your book, I think some there's a point where somebody s describes him as, a, at one point, a, com a combination of Bill Gates and Al Capone. And there is a, s a sense that um, we are reading about a guy who probably, if he were born into different circumstances, would have been more Bill Gates and less Al Capone. There's a sense in which this guy sizes up all kinds of situations and kind of just figures out how they work. Absolutely. Hang out with William. We worked together for five years on a weekly basis to produce this book. So I was with him after incidents on the streets, talking to kids. And he's highly strategic. He used that strategic ability to survive federal prison where he was transferred out of Connecticut because they couldn't manage him in Connecticut. Ended up in solitary confinement in Leavenworth Prison in Kansas for nine months. And that's one thing, Colin, that he absolutely has – in New Haven, in addition to his imposing size, New William's a very, very big guy, and uh, is is the street cred that no one can discount. So the kids in New Haven see him as kind of a legendary figure, but he really has no romance about his past. And as you're fond of saying, William, death or prison, I'm here to tell you that's what the result is um, of, if you continue. And I'm I live that. I know that. There's, William, there's one scene in the book uh, where you're trying to get a guy to walk away from a situation. He kind of knows that he can walk away if you say he can walk away because, in fact, people know who William uh, June Boy Outlaw is and who you were at a time when you had a different kind of credibility. It's kind of like this guy – uh, and maybe this happens a lot. If you say, if you walk away right now, it's no problem. I guarantee you won't lose face. People won't call you a coward. Your word is good enough to kind of convince that guy. I say that's a blessing from God when one can ask a person to walk away from a, a situation that he feels that he has been disrespect or he has been, something has been taken away from him. To ask one to walk away and let them know that you're still going to save faith. You're a man. You're not going to be less than a man by walking away. I truly wish I could have walked away from a lot of incidents 
and, and I know how difficult it is to walk away. So when one walks away in, 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 on my account of me asking to him to let it go or walk away and keep his head up, it's a tremendous uh, blessing from God. It is a blessing from God, but does it also ever strike you as kind of, it's kind of an irony in a way, kind of um, a contradiction in a way. One of the reasons that some guys will listen to you and believe you is because at one point you were a very violent guy. You know, one of the reasons that your word means something is because of who you are now. But another reason your words mean something is because who you were then. The fact that you were very violent at one point kind of allows you in an interesting way to get people to be less violent, which is kind of a weird idea. Yes, the way you put it, I love the way you just put that. Yes, I mean, uh, I'm not going to stand here and I mean, sit here and say that's not. My reputation is a reason uh, about 70% of why uh, one will uh, uh, cohe or listen, uh, cohere or listen. But I also try to give that person an out. Mm-hmm. An out is like, you know, walking away from this is, you know, you know, the situation that you're in that led you to the situation probably wasn't good. So I try to offer a job. I try to offer my men's group. I try to offer support. I try to let the individual know that you're walking away, but you're going to walk away into a better better life. You're going to, you know, it's the, time, it's the time now to leave that alone. The individual that usually being aggressive, aggressive, I'm going to be honest mm-hmm. with you, my French with him probably wouldn't be as this conversation me and you having right now. <laughs> and not in a bully way, uh, not in a disrespectful way, but my tone would be uh, in a way of, uh, look here, knock it off. You, 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 I know guys like you. You, 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 you really put it on a, a, a act. And I'm a good reader character, and I do a lot of follow-up. So before I gauge the individual, I try to learn as much as I can about that individual and, and that's a, that's a, that's another plus that people don't see. It's just not me and my reputation. Uh, if I know one is in the community, he has uh, creating havoc in the community. If I need to reach out to him, I usually do a, a study. A study I me. Mean, I study him and I try to find out everything about him as possible. And what I've seen, William, with you working with the kids, is that you will um, bring different strategies to different types of kids. So you can be highly intimidating and uh, scary Mm -hmm. to a tough kid and then to a kid who's struggling with mental health issues or you know the family situation, you're basically a big teddy bear. And you told me an incident, I just met with you the day after, you'd gone into a house Mm -hmm. right after a shooting, nobody was hurt, thank God, but you accused the kid uh, who you knew to be very dangerous uh, of doing the shooting, you knew that he had not fired a gun, but you said that was entirely strategic on your part to be as intimidating as you could to give him the fear of God. And so I've seen you deploy a, a, a different skill set depending on your audience. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned the mental health and all that. And, I, and another thing I like, you know, I'm a lot of training from uh, Goodwill uh, and, and also CTVIP training, motivation, interviewing, uh, a lot of mental health training, a lot of training now in uh, trauma. And uh, another thing that we're looking at now is untreated trauma. So we have a lot of individuals in the African-American community and all communities that's uh, walking around untreated trauma. Untreated trauma is the, is the breed of anger. You know, you don't get trauma treated for many, many years. That's what any individual, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a breed of anger. I want to circle back to that because I think it's really important. But uh, I also want to um, jump on one thing that William said. Because, Charlie, one of the moments uh, in this book that really made my jaw drop is, you know, we meet uh, William. We see him uh, commit uh, the murder that uh, ultimately uh, incarcerates him. We see him as the leader uh, of the Jungle Boys, this pretty ferocious and respected uh, street gang uh, in in New Haven. Uh, Then we see him go to Summers at a time when Summers was really a scary and violent place. Uh, and yet William is able to rise up to the level of a shot caller, the leader of the black prison community within Summers, a guy who was able to create networks within Summers uh, that into a way that was just was remarkable, would allow him to get weapons, drugs to sell, all kinds of stuff like that. And so I'm reading about this guy and suddenly, and it happens on, let's see, I dog-eared the page. It happens on page 93. You write, but 
away from his public image, beyond all the bravado and the swagger and his relentless displays of guile, Outlaw was exhausted and scared. Every night after his cell door clanged shut, he felt relieved and oddly free. No one could bother him for the next precious seven hours. He had no need to live up to the image that he created, the larger-than-life intimidator. I found that kind of a jaw-dropping moment in the narrative where suddenly – I mean, I've, what I've become is incredibly impressed with the organizational <laughs> skills of this man. But also, he's one scary guy you're, I, I, that I'm meeting. So to hear that it was very interesting. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. I'd love to have William talk about it too, obviously. Yeah, and that was what William told me. You know, we interviewed every week for five years, and that was his exact language. I couldn't wait for the, the doors to clang shut, and I could drop my guard. And I didn't have to put on this act. I think that a lot of the writing of the book and our process together, which has been a very meaningful process for both of us, has been drawing out the vulnerability of William. So the reason why we met so often is in the first literally couple years, and we obviously come from very, very different backgrounds, although we've learned that we have, you know, some meaningful things in common, uh, including being around the same age, growing up in the same state, having the same sports interests and stuff like that. But the, the process was finding his vulnerability. So in the first couple of years, as for me as a writer, first couple of years, William was kind of a big macho guy who told me about his work the way that he did with you a little while ago. But I wanted to get to the psychological vulnerability and that took what Gay Talese called the fine art of hanging out. <laughs> that took two years of us beginning to trust each other and I think your own evolution, uh, William just told me just very recently that our visits actually sent him – it was a good thing – but sent him back to into therapy to a psychologist because I was bringing so much stuff up. And what I also found was I needed to learn how to write – ask the right questions because there's – the cultural linguistic differences between us were profound to begin with. And so I would ask him for years, William, what was it like getting out of prison? It must have been fantastic. You you know, you never thought you'd get out. Oh, it was great. It was great. It was great. And then finally I said, William, what happened on day three? What happened on day four? And he, what he told me was, and this is in the chapter in the book, he didn't sleep for the next nine days because mm. he was so freaked out he, that as you put it to me, William, if you, cl- if you shut your eyes, you'd fall asleep and the dream would be over, you'd be back in prison. So I wasn't, it took us two years to find your vulnerability and mine too with him Mm -hmm. and to get the real story. But I heard that a little bit, William, in the scenario you described just a few seconds ago where you said that you're talking to a hypothetical guy and you said, I know guys like you and I know what's really going on inside too, right? A lot of the guys that you're talking to, the guys that maybe you're going to have to be a little bit intimidating with to get them to calm down, to back down, to step away. I take it you see the same thing inside them that was inside you, which was ultimately fear when there's an opportunity to feel it. Oh, no question. I'm glad you said that. But I wanted to just elaborate on something that I should elaborate, first of all. i like to just understand that as a victim in this case, uh, and he's talked about it in the book, and I am so, uh, I usually, before every time I speak, I usually uh, give him his uh, due respect and his family, and i like for that to occur right now that, uh, uh, he's always in my mind, and that I don't want that to go on her. Uh, You're talking so, about Sterling Williams. Yes, yeah, that is okay. true, and I would like you know understand that that you know we sit here talking about that that, but he is a person that is a victim, and I just like to always you know give him his knowledge and his family mm-hmm. and my sympathetic and my sorryness. Uh, you're right. Uh, they are they are me, and, and I, I tell guys that in my group, I am you. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, 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 so that is right. You are uh, uh, correct like that. I do see that fear. Uh, Charlie left out too. Every night that that door closed, I cried. Mm-hmm. Cried. Literally tears came down my eye. Even if I had a good day in prison, mm-hmm. as far as uh, say the day I achieved my GED or the day I, I, I learned how to do Microsoft or, or just say the day I was in the gym and I had a good workout, I still, if a day was good, a day in jail is never good, but if I had an okay day, I still cried every 24, every night in jail. Every time I lay down in that bed, I cried every night. And uh, and Charlie's right, and, and that's why Charlie, I say now he's the greatest writer because he captivated out of me. Out of me. He, he, bought, he, he bought not just the vulnerability, I call it, he bought the truth out of me about myself as far as uh, 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 issues and 
that I had that I needed to get in the comfort zone and be able to talk to uh, someone about. All right. So we're going to uh, talk more about this fascinating story about this transition uh, that William Outlaw made from a guy who caused problems to a guy who solved problems. We'll do that after this break. You're listening to a rebroadcast of the Colin McEnroe Show. It originally aired November 14th, 2019, here on Connecticut Public Radio. All right, we're back. I'm in the studio with Charles Barber. Uh, his new book is Citizen Outlaw, One Man's Journey from a Gang Leader to Peacemaker, Peacekeeper, excuse me, and it is uh, divided into two segments, Outlaw and Citizen. Uh, both of those segments are about the other man in the studio, William Juneboy Outlaw III, who co-directs the Connecticut Violence Intervention Project a program. I keep saying project. And, and he's also senior community advocate at Goodwill Reentry Program, where he helps formerly incarcerated people re-enter the community. I was astonished to find out that one of the, your influences in the early days, one of the, the th- movies, I, I wouldn't have guessed it was this movie uh, that meant something to you, uh, was, uh, well, let's hear a clip from it. It's from the, this is the movie Once Upon a Time in America, uh, directed by Sergio Leone. You ever think of setting yourselves up in business? All those trucks they're using to haul liquor, soon be selling them for nothing. I'm talking about hundreds of vehicles controlled by a national organization and supported by a powerful union headed by Jimmy Conway. You gotta be kidding, Sharky. Jimmy clean hands in business with us. They won't be clean for long with the hands he's gonna shake. We're not interested. What is the matter here, Noodles? You got a problem? We got plenty of money tucked away. Why not invest it? What is the problem? I put the party behind you and I got friends in high places. I'm not interested in your friends in high places, and I don't trust politicians. Well, that's probably because you still think like some schmuck from the streets. Now, if we listened to you, we'd still be rolling drunks for a living. Who's a famous there? You broke? Don't bust my with those. I am talking about real money. This is real money to me. It's a lot of money. You want any of it? You'll carry that stink of the streets with you the rest of your life. I like the stink of the streets. It makes me feel good. I like the smell of it. It opens up my lungs. It's Once Upon a Time in America. So, William, one of the things that's clear from the book is before you discover a constructive and positive way to use your brain and your body and your soul to, to create more good, you, because of the, you know, you grew up in a very tough family and in a very tough neighborhood, what you discover is that you can at least experience the thrill of leadership and of being an important figure. And I hear that a little bit in that clip. We're hearing James Woods and Robert De Niro talk uh, in that movie. Tell me a little bit more about what that movie meant to you. Well, I, I was, uh, I stumbled across that movie. I was, uh, it came on, uh, I went to the movie theater. I went to the movie to see Sun Nelson, but Somehow it was packed, so I couldn't get in on one theater, no one theater to be packed. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to sit in the front row right up under the theater. And I uh, came back out, and the guy said, man, the Once Upon a Time movie is a real good movie. So I went in there, and there was less people in one room. I was so fascinated by how young they was coming up with ways to make money. I was fascinated by, you know, the little pranks and the little things they was doing to uh, make money and it was seen like it was kids and uh, they put their head together. And it also, you know, and that gave me a sense of, I can do that, you know, I can I can, I can, can think of ways to make money at a young age is that too. Uh, I love the best part about the movie was uh, everybody wasn't a tough, all the guys wasn't tough in the movie. The whole crew wasn't all tough and all badasses. And they had the one friend, the Jewish kid, that father owned a bakery. Mm-hmm. And uh, I liked his character. I liked him because he stayed in his lane and showed that everybody has a part to play. And he played his part real good. So I was fascinated by that part. Uh, then I, as they got older, uh, the clip you just played, they was trying to, 
almost had the same issue I had. You get a lot of money and you don't know how to African Americans in the community don't know how to launder it. You don't mm-hmm. you don't know who to trust and who to who to give it to. So now you start buying uh stupid things like cars and jewelry and stuff that's making you stick out. So uh so I mean that movie in general just put me in a sense of power as I you know, I can I can I can I can do it. They did it and you know, just one of the great movies. Mm-hmm. So the person that I meet in this book Charlie is a person who, uh, once he's in prison, initially is not interested in getting his GED or learning how to use Microsoft or anything like that, is not even interested in working a, a prison job where you make 50 cents an hour making license plates. And for, the, for a lot of the time in prison, the way that you write about William, his goal is – to break the prison system, break the, the the organization of prison rather than be broken by it. He's really not interested in getting what little amount of help might be available to him. Absolutely. He, he terrorized uh, the Connecticut prison system to the degree that um, they the, the Connecticut DOC transferred him out after two years because they could not manage him. He basically recreated the gang within prison. They caught him on wiretap um, calling for drugs to be brought into the system. They couldn't at first get evidence, but they finally got that. That gave them the legitimate reason to send him to the Fed. So basically, the Connecticut taxpayer paid uh, for William Outlaw to leave Connecticut for 12 years to go to the feds and to the most notorious federal prisons in the country, as I say, the the Harvard and Yale of prisons, uh, Leavenworth and Lewisburg. And then I have all the records. William and I got all the records. And it's a tale of two cities, so to speak. It is 50 percent his prison record. He's incorrigible. He is relentless. He is accumulating disciplinary tickets um, at max speed. He ends up in solitary for nine months for saying no to everything, accused of inciting a riot. And then in 96 and 97 – uh, 20 odd years ago, everything changes in six months. Mm-hmm. Everything changes. And I don't want to give everything away, but I would say this, there were two seminal moments. One was a conversation with William's daughter that I'll let him talk about, uh, who was now on, uh, sort of 12 years old. So it was mm-hmm. a, one of your first sort of meaningful conversations, you know, sort of more adult conversations with her. And then the other was um, William was befriended by a legendary gangster from Harlem who was in forever, and he took William under his wing and said, I will never get out. You're a talented guy. If you don't – when you get out, you got to make something of your life. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for me. And in other words, this guy who died a year or two ago uh, called Frank James, he mentored William in the exact same way that William is now mm-hmm. mentoring young kids. And it was the first time in 20 years that someone, a male authority figure, had shown some faith in you. Right. So I want to back up. Uh, I want to get to all of that. And I, th- I think it's important that we talk about the time in solitary too. I, I just want to say as an observation that there, uh, there isn't a lot to laugh at in this book, but there's actually one, one moment that really <laughs> made me laugh out loud. And William... It's when you get transferred to one of the uh, federal prisons uh, and your paperwork isn't there and nobody really knows anything about you. And these white supremacists, these Aryan nations guys, they visit you and they say, we don't know who you are. You might be a snitch. You better not be a snitch. And you have to kind of face them down. Um, and, And then they come back a few days later or a week later and they have a bag for you. And you think, what the heck is this going to be? Uh, and it turns out they say Tiny says hello. Explain who Tiny was. Tiny's, uh, Tiny was a, a good guy, a friend of mine in Summers. Uh, uh, Tiny, uh, when I, before I got to Summers, Tiny was a, was a shot caller for the Aaron Brothers and Bikers in Summers Prison. Right. Uh, got to understand, when I got to Summers Prison, Summers Prison, I was a young kid. Mm-hmm. Summers Prison at the time was notorious, very violent. Uh, when I first got to Summers, uh, they locked. Uh, I couldn't come out for the first two weeks because uh, a captain by the name of Brunson was on vacation. And you, before you get to Summers at this time, and you was high profile, you had to get permission uh, from the captain to go on population. Mm-hmm. So he came on vacation, and I met with him in the morning, and he said, uh, "I don't think you want to go to population." He Which said, "I got general, yeah, general, 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 general population. population." Yeah. yeah, he said, "I have uh, twenty 
20, uh, 20, 20 letters in one box and 50 letters in another box, people saying they're going to kill you if you come up, if you come on the pop, or you come out in general population. Man, and I told them, well, I really, I really check, take my chances going in general population. Uh, so, uh, Summers wasn't, was a very, uh, very hard time for me because I was young and I'm going to be honest, it's the first time I ever experienced racism from authority. Mm -hmm. Uh, the guards, there was very racist. There was also Massachusetts and they was running, they was, they was running Summers and they, 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 you know, they, they didn't play. And, uh, and, and I couldn't relate to that. You mm -hmm. know, here I is, I got about 150,000 on the books on, in my account. And, you know, I just left New Haven. And, I mean, I got a name. I'm not going to be letting these white officers get up in my face and threaten me and do all these type of things. So I, I didn't conform. I did not conform mm -hmm. uh, to the rules at all. Uh, matter of fact, I was uh, uh, really uh, and from 90, you got to understand, from uh, 88 to 92, I lived in Summers Prison with 85 years. Mm -hmm. So for four years, I thought I was never going to get out. Yeah, you had an 85-year sentence. Right. Yeah. I was losing my mind. I mean, for those for those four years from 88 to 92, nobody understand uh, my mind. I, 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 don't, I don't think I got a good, decent sleep in those four years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was watching. I was observing everything. I was plotting escape. Uh, I was self-medicating on weed, uh, alcohol, homemade wine. I, 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 you know, that's how bad it was. Uh, some days would be depressed. Where I wouldn't even get out the bed because uh, and then I was getting taunted by officers. You know, every chance they got, they taunted me. Like, uh, you know, you think you're a Billy Badass. That's why you're going to die here. Uh, you got 85 years. So, I mean. And, and Colin, to circle back to the tiny story. Mm -hmm. So William became the shot caller of about 100, 150, this is all corroborated by corrections officers that I interviewed, of, of the African-American prisoners, Tiny Piskorski, who was not tiny, um, mm -hmm. 300 pounds, and um, was the shot caller of the white prisoners. When William got shipped out and was in Leavenworth in Kansas, he was, he was threatened by the Aryan brothers. The first hour that you arrived on the unit, they told him they were going to throw him over the bay if he was a snitch. Three weeks later, they come back with groceries and toiletries, which is a big deal in prison, saying Tiny sent his regards. You're, you're all right. Mm -hmm. And what happened was through basically the white prison network, they'd gotten word back to Connecticut. Who's this outlaw guy that's shown up in the mm -hmm. middle of Kansas? Is he a snitch? Because mm -hmm. people that show up unexpectedly in federal prison are either considered to be snitches or child molesters or something like that. And Tiny apparently said – no, no, he's a badass. He's he's all right. He's all right. And it, a corrections officer is a major part of the book. Absolutely believes that Tiny Piskorski uh, saved William's life. Mm. At, yes, he did. He, I, I truly believe he saved my life when he saved someone else's life. So a white supremacist saved your life, which is kind of interesting. Um, the um, the I want to talk a little bit about this whole uh, transformation. I think it's the most important thing we're going to talk about today. Um, so. Um, and I think it seems to start during that nine months in solitary uh, in Leavenworth. So that's a long time. It's a long time to be in prison uh, and a long time to be in solitary. So what change? What changes can you talk about that were happening to you in that time? Those nine months, uh, I have been in. I have been in SAG before, mm -hmm. administration detentions, and it was not like those nine months. Uh, we was in a building called uh, 63 Building. It was an old building in Leavenworth, a historic building. Where, where they the kept, Birdman of Alcatraz was. Mm. Yeah, and they kept some of the most dangerous people there. And uh, it was so old, the water used to back up, and it was just a disgusting place and disgusting feeling and some of the most disrespectful and COs, I, I, some of the guards that I never saw in a compound, and that that scared me because mm -hmm. I was on a compound, general population, but when I got to SEG, I'd never seen these officers before, and that, that scared me where they could get away and do whatever they wanted to. But being in solid case confinement like that, uh, you have no other choice but to go all the way back to your whole life. I went all the way back to my childhood. I started, you know. I think I was loosening for really some days. I think it was loosening because I kept repeating uh, 
going back as far as I could, thinking about uh, how did I get here, what you know, what my family's going through, uh, what my kids are doing right now. You know, you, 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 your mind be racing everywhere, you know. Uh, one time, <laughs> I didn't even tell Charlie this, I think one time he brought us some green beans, and I counted every last green bean on a tray. That's mm-hmm. how you'd be so bored, and I probably... Then I kept three of them when I was trying to play marbles with them, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, any little thing you 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 try to get into and get your mind focused on, you trying to be creative. Uh, but that was a very hard time for me. Uh, it had me soul search myself far as now what what you gonna do when you get out of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, what you gonna do when you uh, get out? Or if you ever make it out of solitary confinement alive, what are you gonna do? Uh, so I, I, I say that was a light. I, I don't say the light went all the way off. I would say that's when the light got. The, you know, when they said the light went off, a person wanted to change. Mm. I think when my that's when my light got a little brighter. Right, and so we we should say because we don't want to romanticize this experience. In a way, William is statistically kind of unusual. Solid, uh, solitary confinement is not, for the most part, in any way rehabilitative for most people. The research is is absolutely not. I mean, I tried to write the book to a view of you know William is one of seven hundred thousand people a year that get out of prison. He was caught up in the crack cocaine era. He started the gang at the right time in terms of New Haven history. If he wanted to start a gang, the mafia was ending. The black African-American gangs were starting to take over. So the book is very much about the historical sweep of his lifetime. But at the same time, you are not typical in your strategic acumen. And um, I think that in a, we're not interested in romanticizing solitary. But I th- as you put it to me once – they kicked my ass mm. and you couldn't – you've been – this is the way I see it. You tell me if I'm right or wrong that up until that point, you had felt you could outfox anybody right. pretty much right. and you were like, they, there's nothing I can do. They got control. more resources. I think, I, think, I think all control was given up, yeah. I think they had, they had control. I see that the federal system had a, a better strategic control over me. At that point, when I wasn't excited, yeah, I think they 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 didn't. It wasn't a break; it was a submission. It was a strong submission of me then. All right, we have to just uh, pause, take well, one final break here, and this show is flying by too fast, and this story is too big to tell here, which is why you're going to have to read the book. But we want to tell a little bit more of it when we get back. You're listening to a rebroadcast of the Colin McEnroe Show. It originally aired November 14th, 2019, here on Connecticut Public Radio. All right, we're back. i got to say some thank yous, uh, and those thank yous go to senior producer Betsy Kaplan, uh, who made the show possible, uh, and to Kion Wolf, who's on the board, making the show sound great, I would say. Uh, we're talking to uh, to Charles Barber, uh, author of Citizen Outlaw, and to uh, William June Boy, Outlaw the Third. There's so much to talk about here, and I'm running out of time. I don't like it. Uh, I should say, this book also is like, there are all kinds of weird kind of cameos in this book. There's one moment, uh, William, where you're... Uh, there's something about you on television and Gail King is delivering some news about your case and the guy in the cell next to yours is saying, hey, turn it, you're on TV, you're on TV. And the guy is Richard Crafts, the wood chipper murder guy. Um, <laughs> and it's just like, that's just too bizarre. And uh, obviously Warren Kimbrough, who is a major figure to anyone who followed the entire story of the Black Panther trials in New Haven is a major figure in your life. There's so many major figures. We don't have time to cover them all. But I think it's important to say since you were just talking about solitary, after solitary, and you say it's like the light was halfway on now, you know, the light switch was turned halfway on. And and so maybe you're ready in a way that you don't even realize to participate in your own rehabilitation, your own transformation. And you're not a guy who would be really interested in sitting down in psychotherapy and talking about all your weaknesses and fragilities and traumas. But you get exactly the right social worker, right? A guy named Richard Whitmire? Tell yes. us about him. Well, what happened was uh, uh, he fell on my lap too, like Charlie fell on my lap. <laughs> well, 
I was in at this time. I was transferred to Lewisburg. Uh, I was signed to a block called A Block. A Block was the only uh, uh, cell block in Lewisburg that had single cells. I was the youngest kid in there. It was for high profile individuals, uh, and uh, I never forget. It was the first year of the WNBA championship. I think Charlotte was playing Houston. So I went up to, I came in the yard, off the yard early to watch that game. And uh, the, uh, Aaron Brothers ambushed some D.C. blacks. And they killed uh, killed two of them and drew one real bad. So after that, and that happened in my housing unit. After that, uh, we stayed locked down for about four or five months in our cells. And uh, anyone that had a violent crime was referred to mental health. Mm-hmm. So I went up to mental health uh, after I refused a couple of times. They told me if I didn't go, I was going to be going to segregation. So I went up there and I uh, was signed to this uh, to talk to this guy by the name Doctor Whitmire. And uh, so we get up there. It's just something like the Antoine Fisher movie. We get up there. <laughs> I don't got nothing to say to this guy. I'm just sitting on the couch looking at sports illustrators. I don't got nothing to say to him. I really don't know him. I really ain't going to open up to him nothing about my personal life. You know, he got this seller suit on, so he's got all these jokes he's saying to other people. So I sat there after a couple of sessions, probably after the third session, I was looking through uh, Sports Illustrated. I think I asked him a football question about the Eagles or Penn State, somebody in Pennsylvania, and that's how the conversation started. Mm-hmm. And uh, once the conversation started, uh, I want to say his professional ability really got he 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 had the right buttons to get to me. Right. Uh, then he uh, referred me to a therapeutic group that he was running. Uh, it was a workbook group. You had to buy the book to get in the group. Twenty five dollars. Twenty five dollars. And I asked him why. Why would I want to buy a twenty five dollar book to get in your group? He said, it's show sure commitment that you want to change. Mm-hmm. And I never even thought about it until I completed the book, the show, the commitment. $25 was way worth uh, the treatment that I got out of that yeah, book. Yeah, so best bargain in therapy. <laughs> best um, bargain, yes. So we're going to run out of time here. There's so much stuff I want to talk to you about. Uh, talk about. But, Charlie, um, one thing that you want to talk about, uh, and it, it comes uh, out of the work uh, of another person who studied prison populations – Maybe the way to frame it is, you know, we just talked before about how you look at Williams' files and up until 96 and 97, he's incorrigible. He's so horrible that they they practice what's called bus therapy. They just transfer him around to different prisons so he can't really get his feet on the ground anywhere and start causing more trouble. The whole idea is just to keep this guy off balance because he's he's such a problem. And then he becomes the opposite, opposite. And so there's this term that I'd never heard before about desistance, that maybe some of the things that – made him um, such a major leader of a criminal population and a prison population can be almost harnessed to do the opposite thing. Yeah, there's a movement in criminal justice. You know, the, the field is fascinated with what people have done wrong and, and recidivism, their return to crime, which is appropriate. We're all very concerned about things that people do wrong. But there's a way to flip it, which is to look at desistance. What are the factors that, pe- that stop people from committing crime? So, William is a successful example of someone who has stopped committing crime. The research would show that a guy like William would not stop committing crime Mm -hmm. based on all the things we've been talking about. A friend of mine, a criminologist, asked people who, like William, um, that had stopped, what made the difference? How did it happen? And he compared them to people with similar backgrounds who were continuing. And to make a a, a book – summarize a book in three sentences – The people that had stopped, people like William, took an active control of their story. Even in the way they told their stories, it was active. I did this as opposed to the man did it or it was done to me. They took responsibility for their actions. We saw that earlier. Um, But they were more interested or deeply interested in discovering the good person that they always were. And so a lot of the desistance process was embracing the better parts of themselves. And the last and sort of most advanced part of the desistance process was a desire to give back. Mm -hmm. And so William is a kind of uh, perfect illustration of of this book um, by by a colleague and friend of mine um, called Making Good. And 
I gave William the book and I write about the book in, in Citizen Outlaw and uh, William read it rapidly as everything that I gave him. He read super rapidly and he said, Shad is the guy's name, Shad uh, Maruna. And he goes, he was writing about me, man. That, that's my story. You know, how is it, is it your story? Because we're, unfortunately, we're almost out of time here. But what you did at each stage of your life, one common thread was you did take control of your destiny. You decided you didn't want to be just anybody in New Haven. So you became the leader of a major gang. You didn't want to be just a passive member of a prison population. So you became a shot caller. Is some of that then transferred over to now I want to be a good citizen. So I'm going to, I'm going to, kind of call the shots. I'm going to be, uh, Charlie calls you the, the CEO of your own life. <laughs> yeah, good being a good citizen. I mean, I always consider myself as a good person. I always, And I'm a good judge of character. I always had good people in my life. Uh, it's just that I always made uh, terrible decisions. Now I'm uh, making uh, decisions uh, that's right and it feels so, it feels so good and the outcomes are uh, what it is. But I, I, always, I always feel that uh, there's three things I live by. I tell my men's group. It's no, it's never too late to change. It's never too late to be a father, and it's never too late to get education. So, uh, I mean, I apply those three things to my life, and uh, and I believe that's you know that's the path I'm on, and that's the path I wouldn't trade. Uh, uh, getting out of jail, working at Dunkin' Donuts uh, for that year. Uh, Acting me back in society for nothing in the world. None of the, none of, nothing could compare to the life I have living uh, now and, and you know, uh, doing the right thing and uh, being a stand up uh, man and being a part of society in a positive way. You know, I've only got about a minute left, and I don't know if this is a question that can be answered in one minute. But as you look at the kids right now, the kids you're dealing with who are 14, 15, 16 years old, are they in a more I mean, think about yourself when you were 14 and 15 and 16 and the forces around you that shaped you into who you are. Is it harder to be that age now or harder when you were that age? Harder now with the, with the technology and and uh, everything fast. Everybody want everything fast. Technology is really harder for kids these days than poverty. Poverty is, in, is, is real big in, in the city, so it got it really harder than I have. You really do feel that way. Really it's actually feel, harder yeah, to be young now. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. And it's not even cool to rake leaves now. It's not cool to, to have a paper route, so it's really hard. What do you say to them? Oh, uh, wow. Well, you, you just each said, in, each yeah. individual is different. Yeah. Uh, I try to go to their strengths mm-hmm. and always ask a kid what he like, what he always wanted to be, and I try to push him that way. And I try to spend a lot of time as possible with a kid to get to know him. Uh, that's the main thing. You have to get to know a kid, and and, 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 and that's what it is, building that relationship, building that trust. Mm-hmm. And when the relationship's going to bring about trust, just like any relationship, the trust's going to kick in. Once that kick in, then they're going to open up to you in ways that you would never understand or wouldn't even thought would happen. All right. We have to stop there. The good news is there's so much more of this story for you to read. It's especially good news for Charlie, who would like you to read this book. And so would William. Citizen Outlaw, One Man's Journey from Gang Leader to Peacekeeper by Charles Barber. It is the story of William Juneboy Outlaw III. Thanks for listening today.